Now, uh, the final paper will be presented um, by Marcel Vasquez uh, Chanalate, and it will be on logical clustering and learning for time series data. Uh, so yeah, I'm Marcel Vasquez Chanlate. Um, this is some joint work with uh, Xiao Xingjin, Joe Deshmuk, and uh, Sanjit Sesha. Um, so this is uh, logical clustering and learning for time series data. So I want to start with a motivating example. Um, consider the, this toy lane controller. So on the left here, uh, we have a car that's kind of tracking a lane, and at time equals 10, uh, the, the car receives a lane change command, and so it moves from the bottom lane to the top lane, and then begins tracking the top lane. On the one on the right, we have a similar situation, but you can see that the car overshoots the lane. And what we want to be able to do is kind of quantify that the left trace is somehow a better lane change than the right trace. And so, if we're given a black box that implements this lane change controller, and we run it a bunch of times, we might just see a bunch of data, and we want to, you know, the problem is that there's too much data, and so we need a way to organize qualitatively similar um, traces. So this, uh, this type of problem shows up a lot, even when you actually have the model of the data, because oftentimes the engineer that made the model, you know, doesn't quite understand, you know, they haven't written down a specification for you, they haven't told you how these things are supposed to work. They haven't told you what exactly it means for there to be a lane change. And so we would like to automatically you know, group that these lane changes are better than these lane changes and have a descriptive reason as to why. So the overall, pro uh, the overall method is that we'll take each trace, we're going to project it down to um, uh, a feature space, we're going to perform some uh, clustering using standard uh, off-the-shelf techniques. From the clusters, we're going to extract the parameter region, and then we'll gain um, a representative, a uh, set of representatives for the cluster, and a set of, uh, well, a single specification for the cluster. Um, the contributions being that um, you can use any monotonic parametric logic. Uh, for concreteness, we'll focus on signal temporal logic. Um, that we extract you know, specifications for each cluster, and that these, uh, these specifications are small Boolean combinations of the original uh, parametric logic. So this is the goals. We'll start. So yeah, so a specification in this context, what I mean is just a set of traces. So here, you know, the, we have a signal on the top and a set A. And so um, and we can have multiple uh, specifications, and a parametric specification is just a mapping from some parameter space to a set of specifications. So in a, this work, we're going to assume that the parameter space is some hyperbox endowed with um, you know, just some metric topology, and it's really all we need. So again, uh, we had a talk earlier about signal temporal logic, so I won't focus too much on this slide, but uh, parametric signal temporal logic just changes the constants in the uh, signal temporal logic formula to parameters. So you can here, uh, if I focus on the second example, we had globally, uh, globally it's the case that eventually between zero and one seconds, x is going to be greater than negative two. And you just, instead of saying between zero and one seconds, it's zero and c seconds, and greater than d for some positive numbers. And so, you know, here the hyperbox is actually all of Rn, uh, of R, yeah, all of R2, but you can bound this to be any hyperbox. So, um, traditional ways to kind of group together traces, you'll define some feature or some distance metric, and then you'll employ uh, standard clustering algorithms like k-means, Gaussian mixture models, agglomerative clustering, spectral clustering. But and crucially, you have to define how to measure similarity between traces. So kind of a straw man that you can use is dynamic time warping, where in what you're doing is you're comparing the similarity of the shape of the two signals. So on the top here, we have one signal. And on the bottom, we have another signal. And you're allowed to compare between uh, the absolute distance between two points. But then you're also allowed to stretch time at some penalty. And the actual definition isn't critical, but the key is that it's relating the two shapes. 
allowing some time distortion if, if that helps. And so if you apply that to the kind of toy example that we had at the beginning, you end up with an adjacency matrix that looks like this. So, and if you apply like a, a spectral clustering, which is a, a three-way sparsest cut of that adjacency matrix, what you see is that, you know, on the left here, you have a black and the cyan trace are clustered together. But the reason that they're clustered together is simply because the prefix is the same. The cyan trace overshoots, whereas the black trace doesn't. Similarly, on the right, you have the red, green, and the blue trace have been clustered together. And the, you know, the red and the green trace are fine, but the blue trace overshoots. So the dynamic time warping isn't giving us a good measurement of similarity. And so the idea in this work is that you, ha you use the logical specification itself as your similarity metric. So here we can define the lane change uh, specification as just there's a lane change command that uh, occurs. And so eventually, you get a lane change. And then between 0 and tau seconds, you, uh, you know, this, this um, sign distance from the lane is greater than a. And so what that's measuring is how much of an overshoot you're doing. So that could be negative, that could be positive, but it's telling you how much more you went in over time tau. So here, if we were to fix tau to be somewhat large, um, on the left, you can see that a is near 0, whereas uh, on the right, uh, a has to be somewhat large, maybe like one or two. And so, again, the idea is that we're going to use the metric space that's in the parameter space to kind of give us our similarity metric. So we're going to assume that the, sp uh, the parametric specification is monotonic, meaning that if you increase the parameters under some ordering, that the, sets, uh, the trace sets become strictly larger. Uh, you know, for STL, this is fairly trivial to do by just increasing the parameters, but you can use any parametric uh, specification that you want if you come up with some way of ordering it so that the, 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 set increase, the, the sets increase as you increase the parameters. And so, and then I've, what the green here is what's highlighted is what's called the validity domain. So the, you know, here A and B are less than, you know, the validity domain is in the parameter space, and so A and B are less than C under the product ordering. And so the, the traces themselves, the sets, are going to be ordered that way. So what we can do after we're given the validity domain is we can use the, the boundary of the validity domain to compute what's a tightest, uh, tightest set of parameters such that if you were to change perturb the parameter anymore, you might become uh, unsatisfied. So it's on the boundary. And oftentimes, you don't need the whole boundary. All you need is a Pareto optima of the boundary that kind of characterizes the, the trade-offs that this specification, this trace had to do. Uh, the, yeah, what what trade-off in the parameters you had to do to satisfy this specification? So here, the blue trace uh, maps to the point P1, and the green trace maps to the point P2. And the specification that I showed earlier, the lane overshoot, is monotonic. So if you increase tau, it becomes easier because you have more time to get above the lane. And if you decrease A, you're able to, you know, there's less of a threshold for what it means to be greater. So if you apply this projection uh, using uh, lexicographic ordering between, to, to linearize the, the ordering so you actually get a single point, then you end up with this embedding into uh, you know, R2. And if you apply, you know, if you use the distance metric in R2, uh, where you normalize with, uh, with respect to the standard deviation, you end up with this sparse cut. And this does more or less exactly what we say with respect to our specification. So the cyan and the blue trace are clustered together because they overshoot. Whereas the, you know, the red, black, and the green trace, even though the black trace was kind of swerving at the end, the, the specification just said, that when the lane change happens, then it becomes a good, you know, it doesn't overshoot later. So they're grouped together. And then on the left, you know, those, those two both kind of ignore the lane change command, so they're grouped together. Um, so another thing that we'd like is to be able to generalize uh, the, the clusters that we learn. So the idea is that we take the projection and we use the parameter ranges to, to uh, we compute a bounding box that corresponds to a set of parameter ranges. 
Then, because of the upward closed nature the, in the parameter space due to the monotonicity, if you have a single point P1 and then two points on the edge of the bounding box, you can use the syntactic expression phi, uh, phi of P1 and not phi of P2 and not phi of P3 to encode that bounding box as a single specification. Um, lastly, you know, from our goals, we wanted a set of representative traces that you know, capture everything. And the observation here is that if you have something like this uh, homotopy between the spikes, in the parameter space, this just corresponds to a line. And so if you understood what it meant for a spike to you know, be kind of flat with these parameters and then it became more spiky as you increase the line, uh, you don't really need to see what's in between because what's in between uh, you know, is captured by, these, uh, by your specification. And so we call these extremal traces the, the representatives of the cluster. So I'm going to wrap up, but the case studies, uh, we did three case studies in, our, in this work. One was for detecting uh, bug, uh, bugs and overshoot of a prototype diesel engine. The second was for uh, US 101 freeway uh, driver characterization. And the third was for uh, kind of uh, identifying common mistakes made by students in programming these robots in this uh, uh, massively online uh, course. Uh, yeah, so in conclusion, uh, we, we, for each trace, we project down to uh, the parameter space, we cluster, we get representatives and a specification. Um, and then for future work, we're hoping to, you know, kind of remove the need to come up with a specific template or uh, parameterization based off of uh, some uh, very guided enumerative search. Um, and then also using the validity domains themselves, the boundaries of the validity domains themselves as features to remove the need to come up with a projection. Yeah, so. Let's thank the speaker. Um, we have a very generous amount of time for questions left over. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if maybe not all questions got answered in the course of his presentation. So um, who wants to step forward? Yes, please. So does uh, parametric STL have, do the traces that satisfy the same parametric STL um, formula, do they have any uh, uh, distance relation or, or, or is there any mathematical expression such as some metric which is satisfied by all the traces that satisfy a specific uh, STL formula that, that you have considered or? Yeah, so um, if, let me see if I properly understand the question. So you're asking that if you have two separate traces that both satisfy the same STL formula, <laughs> you're interested, like if there's a metric on the signals themselves, exactly. if you're going to be able to bound that. Yes, so that, that has been done. Um, I guess the quantitative semantics of the STL bound the, the differences. So if they're projecting to the same point, that means that the robustness is zero because they're, on, they're both on the boundary. And so they, they have a bounded amount of error in, in your distance metric. Thank you. So for the, pro hi, I'm hi. over here. Uh, for the projection that you were using to group things together, yeah. uh, did you find that that was really the best projection or did you have any data to compare? There's other options. Yeah, so uh, we have compared with other options. For those ones, the, for most of the, the case studies that we initially started with, uh, we first started with the lexicographic projection just because it's a fairly efficient one to compute. Um, but other ones that we've played with are these, uh, you know, scalarizations of using, like, you know, you know, you weight this one by this much, and you know, this one, the other parameter by some, uh, by another amount, and you try and minimize that. Um, those work well when you want two parameters to be roughly the same. Um, but the follow-up work that we're doing with using the boundaries as features kind of eliminates this whole need, uh, and so we're hoping to have a post, post story uh, uh, projection. So what you would do is you would cluster, and then you'd figure out the projection. All right, um, if there are no further questions, then I would propose we give not just this speaker, but all the speakers in the session a further round of applause, please. <laughs>